Hello everyone, welcome back to this series dedicated to Orlando Furioso. Today we're going to read canto number 14 of Orlando Furioso, which uh, is a little bit of a complex canto because it's got something behind the scenes, some different layers of history especially that Ariosto is referring to and that if we don't know we're going to miss a lot of the core of the canto. For example, even in, in his initial exhortation in uh, stanza number two, Ariosto is already speaking to his boss, Alfonso d'Este, and uh, he's saying to him, Alfonso, if present day with ancient histories can be compared with you, you who made Ravenna so regret your expertise, when sacked and plundered, she so dearly paid for help against the Spaniards. So, what is Ariosto referring to here? He's referring to the famous Battle of Ravenna of uh, 15. 12. This Battle of Ravenna saw on one side the Pope and the Spanish allied, and on the other side the French and uh, other groups of people, among whom we had the Ferraresi, the Estensi, including Alfonso, of course. Ariosto, speaking to Alfonso directly, he reminds him, as an, with an encomiastic value, of course, he reminds him his crucial role, the crucial role of his forces, in a moment of the battle where the French were, were weak and he uh, charged the Spanish with uh, hundreds of uh, young uh, knights. And this action uh, helped turning the fate of the battle in favor of the French and of Ferrara, and so it was a great victory for the French. However, Ariosto reminds Alfonso and his listeners, his readers, that there were so many losses on the French side, on the Ferrara side, and the, the, the victorious army side, that it was a little bit of a sad victory for this reason. And he takes the tone of uh, some uh, of the most famous classic epic poems. This is where we can see in between the lines a lot of references to older and ancient poems behind this Canto 14. Because right after his opening exhortation, Ariosto rehearses a catalog of ships, basically a listing of all the Spanish and African forces that have rallied uh, to the help of Agramant in his war against Charlemagne in the, in the Orlando Furioso. Now, this is a pretty clear reference to, on one hand, to Homer. And we know that in the Iliad, in the second book of the Iliad, the Homer gives uh, uh, some kind of a catalog of ships, which is a very detailed list of all the factions that sail to Troy to teach Trojans a lesson. We can remember somebody who has studied Homer at school can remember how book two of the Iliad is one of the most painful ones because it's so full of details and uh, apparently useless uh, types of forces and ships. And we remember that something very similar had been done by Virgil in his Enaid when it was his turn to describe uh, all the parade of different armed forces that were going to attack the people who were going to then found Rome or the most important city in, in that part of history. So in Orlando's Furioso history, the most important city in the world is Paris. And there are so many parallelisms because on one level, the army of Agramant corresponds to the Italian forces under Tornus and Camilla and they are the bad guys in the story. Charlemagne and his Franks, along with their united allies, European allies, basically correspond to Aeneas and all the noble survivors of Troy, who are the good guys. But on another level, the siege of Paris that is described in Orlando Furioso for Ariosto is a way to sing about the siege of Ravenna that was much more recent and much more real in Ariosto's history. Ariosto clearly links the Siege of Paris to this Battle of Ravenna in the first stanzas of uh, Canto 14. Just like in Virgil, we have the good guys, who in this case are the Italian and the French, and we have the bad guys, who are the Pope and the Spaniards, who are banging at the door. So there is a reversal there. The correspondence of the poems let's say, groups or tribes with the real-life players and actors is very clear. What seems to be even more subversive and even more, let's say, cheeky from Ariosto's side is that 
the character in Orlando Furioso, who pretty clearly is playing the role of Pope Julius, who was very rapacious of land. He was more of a, he called himself Julius because he was a, a fan of Julius Caesar. So he was much less of a Pope and much more of a war general. Julius in the Orlando Furioso has his uh, counterpart in King Agramante. Agramante. And uh, Agramante is the king of the, of the Moors, the king of the Muslim forces. This uh, type of sarcasm or irony absolutely was not lost on Ariosto. After the list is done, it's time for us to meet with Mandricardo, this uh, Moor, this Saracen warrior who is extremely strong and who hates Orlando. He wants to find Orlando and steal his armor to use it for himself. In fact, in particular, he wants to steal his sword, Darindana, because he swore to, to do that. It was, it was his vow. Mandricardo seems to be a knight with uh, very profound anger management issues because as soon as he, as soon as he finds a group of uh, Spaniards and he talks to their guardian, I'm, I'm looking at uh, stanza number 40, 41 and 42. They explain to Mandricardo that uh, the king of Granada has ordered them to escort his daughter, very beautiful daughter, her name is Doralice, to Rodomonte, whom Doralice will marry. These are the plans. But uh, here, between stanza 41 and 42, not even in, in the whole two stanza, we, we have a normal civil conversation going from uh, <clears throat> question and answer to a sudden murder very quickly. The conversation goes south very, very quickly. In fact, uh, Mandricardo orders this uh, chief of the guards to bring Doralice to him. He wants to see her. And he says, Costei per quanto se ne intende è bella, e di saperlo ora mi giova. I want to see her. A lei mi mena, o falla qui venire, caltrove mi convien subito gire. I'm also in a bit of a rush, so do this quickly. The guard doesn't hesitate a moment. He just says no. He says, Esser per certo dei pazzo solenne. This is the beginning of stanza 42. You must certainly be crazy if I think that I'm gonna let you see Princess Dorolice. It's not gonna happen. And in the next five lines, this guy is murdered by Mandricardo just for having said no. Stanza 43 reminds us that the Darindana sword that Mandricardo is uh, looking, looking for and uh, going after is the famous sword that belonged in antiquity to Hector. And we can see how there is a direct link between the Iliad and uh, the Orlando Furioso. In an explosion of violence, Mandricardo decides to kill almost everybody because he has set his mind on seeing Doralice. He wants to see this princess. He kills the majority of the guards, of the people who are in this encampment. And in a typical chivalry poem way, he runs away with the damsel, with Doralice. They spend the night together, and in the morning, both of them are actually happier than in the evening. That's what Ariosto says, which is something that our modern sensitivity could very well and very rightly find disgusting. From stanza 65 to the last stanza, which is stanza number 134, so very long canto, Ariosto describes uh, the siege of Paris and uh, the actual war. The tone, the language changes a little bit, it becomes a little bit more, in fact, serious, epic and uh, solemn in a sense, because this is a great battle, a great war. And this section opens with the famous prayer that uh, Charlemagne is praying in the major, what Ariosto calls the major temple of uh, Paris, which is the cathedral. And the type of uh, spiritual domino effect that this uh, prayer by Charlemagne uh, kicks in or starts is uh, very curious. It's, it's, first of all, is something that is much closer to the classical myths and the, the, the way the pagan gods used to work than the Christian God. So we, we have to um, highlight this point. But what happens is that everybody's guardian angel um, flies up to talk to God and uh, God, as an answer, allows, uh, sends his archangel Michael to help, to help the French army. 
Archangel Michael finds a very convoluted way to help the French, including looking for silence and looking for discord to help the French army, which <clears throat> in itself we still don't know exactly what they're going to be used for by Archangel Michael, but uh, it's very clear that this is not something that corresponds to Christian theology, not in the least. Uh, even just at a very basic level, the fact that God would uh, use some demonic forces, some uh, sinful forces like discord, in order to answer some, some specific prayers. Finally, having found silence, Archangel Michael allows for things to work out very well for the French, in a way that Rinaldo, with the English forces that were traveling towards Paris, in a supernatural way, they are able to get to Paris only in one day, while they were actually much farther away. These are clearly very pagan ways for the gods to help, mixed in a Christian reality, and Ariosto doesn't seem to care much about it. With uh, Stanza 98, the war begins, the big battle begins. There is a signal and a sound, and the battle begins. The knight Rodomonte, who is a Saracen, he goes through the first uh, defense, line of defense, he kills a lot of Christians, and uh, he frees one of the defense towers of Paris. And from there, he uh, allows some of his companions to actually get in the space between the first and the second walls of Paris. What happens is that uh, the Parisians, or the Christians, the French, then light a big fire in that whole area, therefore burning all the Saracens who have penetrated the, the space between the first and second wall. Rodomonte saves himself because he jumps to the second line of defense, to the second tower, but all the other Saracens die in this great fire. And the flames of this fire are so high that they reach up even to the moon, to the point that they are even drying the humid breasts of the moon. This is what Ariosto says. In the second last stanza of the canto, he says, Tornò la fiamma sparsa, tutta in una, che tra una ripa e l'altra al tutto pieno, e tanto ascende in alto che alla luna può da presso asciugar l'umido seno. And the very last two lines, Non più, signor, non più di questo canto, no more of this, uh, of this canto, signor, my lord, because I am too shaken, and also my voice is hoarse now from singing this long canto. And this is the end of Canto 14 of Orlando Furioso. Thank you for watching.